You're very welcome to this conversation about the ideological underpinnings of the Putin regime. Here is what happened. Um, many of you have emailed, written in, wrote comments, sent pigeons, asking me to have a look at a recent video on the ideology of the Putin regime by Kraut and give my reaction, particularly on Kraut's commentary on the link between Ivan Ilin and Putinism. And here is what I said before I watched Kraut's video, which I've just finished watching. And I said this in the comments under the last video on the chat channel here. Um, I'm going to make time to see it soon, but I'm 95% sure that my commentary will contain these two things. One, Putin doesn't really read these people properly. He takes quotes, he's given quotes, he's completely uninterested in how any of these people's ideas shape up overall. His relationship with all these texts is pop and superficial. The Putin regime, this is the second point, is not a regime of ideas. His attitude to all these texts is extractive. These ideas are not used by, but exploited. There is no thinker who Putin is in any significant way following. So what's my reaction having watched Kraut's video? Now, I just want to acknowledge that writing and producing a video essay on YouTube is a craft of its own kind. It's actually different to anything else you could do. It has its own specific coercive genre requirements. And I want to acknowledge that. And I want to acknowledge Kraut. I don't know whether you go by Kraut or whether you go by your name on YouTube. But I want to acknowledge Kraut for... Uh, producing this essay. I know just how much it takes to come up with that. It's an extraordinary amount of work. And anybody who does that sort of thing, and on the basis of this video I've watched, does it responsibly, is of course my brother on this platform. So let's know a couple of quick things about Kraut's video and then discuss the, the, the main thing I want to focus on, which is this conversation about linking Eileen to Putin. The first thing um, is Kraut's treatment of Alexander Dugin. And I think Kraut's basically um, right on the money here. Um, there's a tendency to overestimate Dugin in the West. And in fact, much of Dugin's influence inside Russia works in this very peculiar way. They try to leverage the myth of Dugin's importance in the West and then um, import it back into Russia. So it's completely correct to say that beyond Dugin's own aspirations, um, he has no political significance in Russia. And it's important to dispel um, all of these stories about how he is Putin's brain. Um, do, the, the group that Dugin represents has increased in its political significance now. <clears throat> this kind of turbo patriot group, as they're called. Um, but Dugin's own influence is limited and his capacity to influence Putin directly is essentially at zero. Then there's something else that I've made a note of that Kraut says that I actually think is um, analytically and historically impeccable or almost impeccable. And Kraut says that a self-serving mafia state is compatible with an ideologically driven state. And I think that's absolutely right. In other words, um, I often like to say that if you want to understand what it's like to face the Putin regime, it's like finding that your local village priest is also the local village thief. Um, however, what I recommend you put instead of ideology in that place is just some kind of a cart, shopping cart, with various kinds of snippets of civilizational visions, mystical visions, some cer certain kinds of superstitions and occultish thoughts that Putin has gathered. Um, and I think we might say a bit more about why that's the sort of thing we want to put there alongside the quasi-mafia banditry quality of the regime, um, rather than ideology. But then the, the center of our um, reaction chat should be what Kraut says about Eileen, because that's what you're asking about and his influence on Putin. And Kraut says, and I've written down the quotes, 
Ilin is an important ideological influence on Putin. One of the core influences of Putin's understanding of Russia, of politics, of Putin's uh, political beliefs is Ilin. And then a paraphrase, paraphrase, to understand Putin, you've got to understand Ilin. And last quote, Ivan Ilin is the most important political theorist shaping the ideological underpinnings of the modern state of Vladimir Putin. Is this true? No, it's false. Um, what kind of claim is it? It's a claim about psychological reality. It's a claim about what's in Putin's head. Um, it's not a claim about how many times Putin mentions Ilin, although that could, in an ill-advised way, be considered as evidence for Ilin's influence. And it's not about the shape of the Russian state. It's about what's in Putin's head. Um, where do you start with this? Well, there are people who make that link in our culture. Perhaps the most prominent one who does that is Tim Snyder. And you can start reading about Tim Snyder's link between Eileen and Putin in the New York Review of Books, if you like. That's a really, it's a really brief way of getting yourself into that conversation. And Snyder is someone we'll talk about because I've had a video clip sent in to which I've promised to do a uh, um, reaction video uh, where Snyder's interview and he's talking about how Russia needs to reevaluate itself into intellect its intellectual traditions. Mm. Snyder is special because he's got both an imagination and a social conscience. And that's a rare combination because the two often pull you in opposite directions. And Snyder has a voice of his own. He has depth as an historian, and he has a wonderfully seductive capacity to teach. And his lectures on Ukraine that are now available on YouTube are uh, marvelous. They deserve criticism too, and they're going to get some criticism sh shortly, I imagine, from Andrei Baumeis, the Ukrainian philosopher and public intellectual. But Snyder is not an expert on the intricacies of the Putin regime. And um, I'm unimpressed with Snyder's link between um, Eileen and Putin. Snyder is wrong. And it's not the right place for me now to comment on how accurate uh, Snyder's representations of Eileen himself are. So where do we go with this? Well, I think one place to go is to somebody who reads Eileen, um, who is an intellectual, who knew Putin quite well, and who is one of the um, political technologists behind early and mid-Putinism, and that's Gleb Pavlovsky. And Pavlovsky gets asked probably 25 times a year about the links between Eileen and Putin. And every time Pavlovsky dismisses them, laughs them off, and says that instead he has recently become convinced that Putin has been reading um, the um, war fiction of Viktor Suvorov. And that's much more like it, in my view, um, if we're going to make guesses about what we're going to discover in the future about Putin's reading list and how much time he spent with which kind of book. Um, and what does that say? I mean, that just says that I can't think of a single person who is in an engaged way experienced with the Putin regime who, who would sing siren songs about that connection between Eileen and, and Putin. Somebody else worth mentioning is uh, Martinov, who is the um, editor-in-chief of Nova Gazeta Europe, because he's a professional philosopher by training. Um, and he is also asked 74,000 times a year about the link between Eileen and uh, Putin. And he wrote for the you know, millionth time about this um, just a few days ago after Putin's speech, because Putin again mentioned um, Eileen. And here is what Martinov said. I'm going to translate it on the spot, so this is going to be slow. Um, Putin ended his speech um, with a quote in passing from Ivan Ilin, 
whom Nikita Mikhalkov once sold to Putin as a candidate for a good personal, for, for a favorite philosopher to have. In fact, Martinov writes, Ilin has no influence on the ide ideological origins of Putinism. If only because Putin's rule is radically anti-intellectual. Putinism is radical anti-intellectualism. But I would recommend Putin, when he has more time, to actually read some Alin. And in particular, read Alin on the resistance to evil by force, in which the philosopher argues against the pacifism of Leo Tolstoy. When evil comes to your house, you're forced to answer it. This is what Ukraine is teaching us now. And interestingly, during that speech, about which Martinov is writing here, um, Prokhanov asked a question. Prokhanov is somebody who is, in certainly in the liberal circles in Russia, is possibly uh, more heard than Dugin, um, with a Duganite position, a position similar to Dugin in many ways. So this is a guy who talks about the extraordinary spiritual beauty of the advancement of Russian tanks. He's in his mid-80s now. He was there and he asked Putin a question. He said, Mr. Putin, you know, talk about this special military operation, but in fact it seems to me that what's happening is that via our military operation, we are offering the world a new religion of justice, a distinctly kind of Russian contribution to what justice is for human beings that the world could absorb and learn from. And Putin immediately became allergic to this and said, um, made a joke. Um, and his joke was, Mr. Brahanov, I read you. He doesn't. I follow your work as a patriot. He, he doesn't, but he says this stuff all the time. Um, but we've had enough religions of this and that kind. We just need to make the right decisions about our foreign policy. Now, is that entirely fair as a response? No, because there is this kind of mystical civilizational turn that's very important to understanding Putin. And Putin has been <clears throat> on that journey um, since about 2012, um, if not earlier. But I wouldn't call it an ideological journey. I would see it in a quite consumerist way. Um, the Ukrainian philosopher Andrei Baumeister says that Putin has an extractive and exploitative political technology sort of based uh, relationship with all ideas, including ideas he proclaims as supposedly his own. And I say that it's a consumerist relationship. It's a similar claim that there's a kind of trolley and Putin is going around with it. He sees this sort of occultish thing. He sees this kind of superstitious ritual. He sees that kind of historical vision, civilizational image, and he keeps putting all that stuff into his trolley. So it's a kind of ill-assorted mess of a man who is gathering stuff, doesn't have an intellectual bone in his body, um, and that sort of plays a kind of role um, in the way he's thinking about Russia's mission and the way he's thinking about um, how Russia's sense of collective self-realization is now tied to his own, but it's not to his own destiny, his own biographical destiny. But that's short of saying, you see, that there is an important, significant connection there between Ilin and Putin. It's just to say that certain things Ilin absorbed from the culture and spat back out into the culture, you do find in some aspects of the way the Putinist regime operates. But think about it like this. And here we might say something about the way ideas relate to practice in general and the way practice relates to ideas. It's not true 
that a philosopher comes up with an idea and then a culture either follows it or it doesn't. Not at all. As the wonderful philosopher Ch Charles Taylor likes to say, the causal arrow between practice and ideas goes in both directions. So when certain ideas about individual rights arise in the West, it's not that they're concocted in ivory towers and then they are released into the culture. It's rather that um, the thinkers who think them can only think them because these ideas are already in an a uh, sort of semi-expressed way present in the culture. They absorb these ideas. They intensify these ideas and spit them back out into the culture, which is interestingly why um, a lot of great thinkers are wrong, but deep at the same time, because they make intensely rich uh, errors. So imagine that we apply this to you now. Imagine that you're writing a comment underneath one of these videos and you say, how can the world be this awful? Surely there has to be a way in which we can visualize an ultimately just world, and surely that's got to be possible in, in principle, if not in practice. And actually, there's a lot of people who do say that under these videos, and women say that more often than men. And imagine that on top of saying that, you say, oh, here's a quote I like from Kant, and here's another quote I like from Kant. Well, now, what have we got? We've got an interesting situation because what is Kant's, bear with me now, please, what is Kant's moral philosophy in terms of the essence of the key concern it expresses, the key vision it expresses? I think that what Kant does with his moral philosophy is take from the culture the idea that you could have an ultimately just world in principle, if not in practice. And he intensifies that idea and systematizes it on a level of extraordinary architectonic splendor. He spits it back out into the culture. Um, and because he systematizes that idea in such an extraordinary way, people who are animated by that idea are not going to be able to make much sense of um, Kant's writings, even his writings in moral philosophy, when you when they dip into them, unless they're a professional philosopher. So, what do I say about you in that case? Are you are you following Kant? Are you significantly influenced by Kant? No, I don't think I will say that. Even though there's certainly um, various kinds of stuff swimming um, in you, that is also swimming in the culture that Kant also engaged with and absorbed and spat back out into the culture. So you're certainly going to see echoes of that kind, but I am compelled to say that roughly people like Pavlovsky, people like Martinov are correct in saying that Eileen's intellectual influence on Putin, Eileen's influence on the implementation of Putinism really has been um, overstated um, and that we have got to think of that civilizational turn of Putin's in a different way. We've got to think about it as a, as a kind of a, you know, a man with a trolley who is an amateur historian, an amateur thinker um, suffering from um, isolation, e enormous uh, um, uh, delusional grandiosity and he's putting different sort of stuff into his 